Let's get in. We are here. And let's get it popping. Ladies and gentlemen, let's get this live going. Let me start recording on my end. We are in the building doing the live late night tap in. Welcome everybody. Come on in the room. Hop on in and let's do how we do and get down how we get down. Let me first have everybody give me a nice retweet. Retweet the live to let everybody know we're here. What's going on, Party Goy? Why are you doing the sad face? What's going on, brother? What's up, Jeff? See, Party Goy's doing the sad face. Is there some? Did you miss out on some white bussy? What happened, brother? Why are you doing the sad face? Let me get Party Goy in here real quick. Hold on. He's giving a sad face. Party Goy. Why, Adonis, why are you giving a sad face, man? What's wrong? I'm just having a rough night. I freaking, my PS5, like one of my save data is corrupted. So I lost all my game progress. And now I got to restore my save from my backup on my hard drive. So it's just kind of annoying, man. No, oh, okay. Okay. I thought something bad happened to you. Okay. I'm good. Okay, good. Okay. Hopefully you get your PS5 and everything together, man. All right. Thank you. All right, brother. All right. I thought uh, he got abandoned by a white man or something. You know, Adonis love him, a good white man. Shout out to him. I ain't knocking nobody's lifestyle. But y'all pile on in the room, man. We are in here. We're going to get heavy. How many people we got? We got, bam, 228 people within the first 20 seconds. So it's going to be a, a heavy night tonight. Everybody pile on through. By the way, y'all come on down to the Hidden History Museum this weekend. It's open tomorrow, Friday, and Saturday. We're going to have an event at the Hidden History Museum Saturday, September 14th. We're going to have a lot of comics up. We're going to be featuring our brother Freeze Love, very funny comedian, and many, many others. Um, we're going to have our caterers there. Let me know what kind of food y'all want to have there. Let me know what kind of food you guys want to have. We're going to have it catered. Fun night, man. We always have fun at the Hidden History Museum, so we want everybody to come out to our event. We haven't done an event there in a few months because I've been traveling, and a lot of people have been requesting that we do an event at the museum, and we're going to have an event for the family September 14th, Saturday, September 14th. So we'll, we'll get all of the details to you um, possibly by next week, and you can start getting your tickets and all that good stuff. So if you have not been to the Hidden History Museum, it is a vibe. It is a major vibe. We have a great time at the Hidden History Museum. Um, shout out to everybody who was tuning in last night. Last night, after I'd done my live, I did my live last night. Um, I got done, it was around, like a little after midnight here. It wasn't too, too late. Family, I got real sick yesterday. After I did my live, I got real, real sick, man. I think it was because... Earlier in the night, I ate cereal, and usually I have I use almond milk for my cereal, but since my kids are in school, my lady has been giving all my kids the damn almond milk, so the only thing that was in the fridge was this whole ass milk, that regular whole cow milk. My wife usually uses that for cooking stuff and baking stuff, but I drank that shit with the cereal, and I haven't eaten or drink drank whole milk in a long time that cow milk and i'm thinking that's what messed me up i'm that shit i was toe up last night man my, i was getting like severe cramps in the stomach i'm like balled over cramped stomach i start throwing up all over the place so i almost went to the emergency room man i was real i was down bad man my eyes was bucking you know when you're throwing up your eyes get to bucking and popping out your damn head that my throat crazy because all that stomach acid is hitting my throat i was down bad man and again i'm thinking it was that damn milk and again i haven't i don't really drink regular milk but family stay away from that whatever they're putting in the milk now stay the hell away from that i was down bad man man i was i had packed my bags 
getting ready for the emergency room. Like I was up at like four in the morning sitting here with a little knapsack, like I'm about to go get an abortion and some Crocs on, you know? You know how y'all women be dressing for, y'all go to the abortion clinic, get dressed down and take your little knapsack and a book with you. <laughs> so so I, I was down bad, man, but I'm, I'm cool now. I'm cool now. But um, yeah, stay away from that damn milk. Stay away from that. That ain't nothing to play with. Uh, but um, I'm here. I'm here. Ready to do what it do. Y'all pop on in here, man. Let everybody know we're live. Let, let everybody know we're live. We're going to get some calls in a minute. Now, um, family, I um, put out a formal invitation to Kamala Harris and to Donald Trump, either one of them, to come down and have a conversation with me at the Hidden History Museum. I put out a formal open invite on all of my social media. So I know they see it. So they see it. Let's be real. They see it because what happens is, um, as you know, the Democratic shields, they send the shields to come invade my spaces all the time. So they they know what we do. They they monitor all of our moves and movements and rooms. They monitor everything we do. So we know they're, they're already watching. There's a bunch of Democratic shields in here now. Um you know, the right wingers, they, they're watching what we do. They're using a lot of our language. So all of them are watching um, the grassroots and certain influencers like myself and activists like myself. So they're watching. <clears throat> so since they're watching, I said, hey, man, look, let's have um, I'm going to give a formal invitation for Kamala Harris to come on down to the Hidden History Museum. Sit down with me. We get the cameras up there and just talk. We can have an audience there. We don't have to have an audience there. Whatever makes them comfortable. Donald Trump is welcome and invited to come down to the Hidden History Museum here in LA. Sit down with me, somebody who's a very well-respected activist, influencer, social justice warrior, the nine, everything you want to put in there, put in there. And I'm nonpartisan. I'm not committed to any political party. So it's not going to be no type of ambush with political jargon from another party. I'm not, I'm not going to do that with the NABJ did. I don't like what they did with Trump. And again, I'm a member of NABJ. I don't want to be a part of organizations or I don't want organizations to pawn themselves off as some type of neutral organization, but they're really a shill organization for a certain political party. That, that's not what you're supposed to be about. You're supposed to be neutral. And again, when Trump came up there, they were supposed to be neutral. So look, if Trump wants to come sit down and talk with me at the Hidden History Museum, it's not going to be none of that ambush stuff. We're going to talk policy and it's going to be respect. You don't invite nobody anywhere to be disrespectful. And there's a lot of people who said, well, why are you inviting Kamala Harris? Because you've been dissing her or whatever. Yes, I've been talking about her lack of policies. Those are very legitimate criticisms. But if I invite her to the museum, which I've had, which I have, and if she takes the invite, I'll be nothing but respectful. I'm not going to ambush her. I'm not going to be disrespectful. If I invite somebody somewhere and they accept the invitation, you're going to be afforded the utmost respect. I don't do that ambush stuff. I, I do things in good faith. I don't do none of that ambush stuff. We do, we're going to talk policies. I'm going to let you tell us what the business is going to be on your end. I'm not, I don't do all that gotcha stuff. If Trump or Kamala wants to sit down with me, it's not going to be one of them shade points where I'm trying to be sassy and um, there's not going to be any gotcha moments, none of that stuff. We're going to talk policy. I really want to know policy. Okay. I really want to know what the policies are going to be. Yeah. Um, somebody's saying that my space is my space being promoted. Hold on. My, my brother McCall just hit me up. What's, what's going on with my space? Hold on. He's Hold on one second. He said that my space doesn't seem like it's being promoted on the top of the app. Let me see something. Um, Y'all bear with me one second. I'm going to look and see where I am with this thing. Um, if you guys can give a retweet, that would be great. If you guys can give a retweet, that would be absolutely phenomenal. 
and I'm going to retweet the space myself. Okay, I'm looking, looking. Okay, I, I see it on my end. Okay, let me retweet it. I'm reposting it. All right, so yeah, I see it on my end. So, okay. Um, I don't know what's going on with this thing. Hold on one second. Uh, listen, lie. Okay, I see what my, my guy is saying. Yeah, usually they post our spaces on the top of the app. I don't know. I don't know what's going on, but we'll we'll work through it. But I just need you guys to retweet everything. If you can retweet everything, that'll be great. But like I was saying, I'm going to go back into the Trump and Kamala thing with them. If, uh, again, they want to sit down and, and talk policy, I've officially put the invite out there. So they can come sit down with us and talk policy. Let us know what you are going to do specifically for the black community in form of tangibles, just let us know what you want to do or what you're going to do and why the black community should vote. And let us know how electing either one of you will help Foundation of Black Americans progress. Let's just get down to the nitty gritty. Let's no Amber Rose, no Megan the Stallion twerking, no catfish nuggets. Um, None of these um, um, gimmicks, none of this stuff. Let's just get down to this. Let's get to the policies. Let's get to the policies and let's get to the money. What kind of money, what kind of numbers, what kind of tangibles are we going to get to motivate us to get out here and vote? Y'all excuse the noise in the background. My wife is very heavy handed when it comes to washing dishes and stuff in the middle of the night. So which who do y'all think will take the invitation first? Do you think Trump or Kamala Harris will take the invitation? Because they know, they know, and this would be very big for them. Let's be very real. If they sat down with a real person who's out here, um, a real influencer, somebody who basically, come on, man, we... What is my wife? It's so damn loud in there. It sounds like uh, the kitchen at Olive Garden in here. My wife is very loud. Tell mom to shut it up, Tell. Yeah. Mom is extremely loud. Good Lord, it's loud in here. Okay, he went in there and said, Mom, Dad said, shut up. I didn't say that now. My son went in there and told my wife, Dad said, shut up. I didn't say that. I didn't say that now. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> um, but like I said, going back to Kamala and Trump, going back to Kamala and Trump, um, again, this is not going to be a situation where um, I'm trying to shill for a particular party. Again, I'm not committed to any party. This would be a great sit down because it would be authentic. Um, it would be real and you can really get to hear what they have to say and what they're going to do. And they're talking to somebody real, not one of their plants, because a lot of times they do that. Um, the Republicans and the Democrats do the same thing. They will go get a Tim Scott. They'll get one of their Republican shills, get one of their sambos and sit down with them and say, hey, um, let's do an interview from a, a black perspective. And basically they got a bunch of, it's a bunch of loaded answers. So they go get some Republican shills, some sambo, and they're asking questions that's already preordained by the Republican Party. When, is you going to give some money to the church? Stuff like that. Well, I don't need no reparations. We don't need to be begging you good white peoples. We need to pull ourselves up by the bootstraps. I thank you so much for encouraging me to pull myself up by my bootstraps. You, you have that. You have like a right wing sambo. And the left does it. They do the same thing. The left, they'll do these photo ops and quote unquote barbershops that they didn't set up a bunch of Democratic shields in, and that that's all cap. So yeah, we don't we, let's let's have a real conversation. No shilling, 
just the a person who represents the views of the average black everyday person. The most black people in everyday life, we're, we're not shilling for no political party. You have real issues that you would like to have addressed. And that's what we want to do. I want to sit down with one of them, either one, one or both of you, whatever, to talk about real issues from the perspective of foundational black Americans who's not committed to any political party. We're, politi we're committed to policy. So we want to know what kind of policies they have. Do we have any Democratic shields in here? We got any Democratic cats in here? Because uh, the DNC sends a lot of you guys to sit here and listen to our talking points. And, you, and, and this is another thing, too. You better understand, um, these spaces are being watched and monitored. I saw something where um, in the, the um, Fulio murder case, the suspects, they got recordings of them on Twitter space, um, low-key using coded language about the murder. So I'm telling you, they monitor everything. They monitor everything that goes on. They monitor these spaces big time. They monitor these spaces. All right? Majorly. So again... They listen. We know they're in here. We know they listen. And by the way, that 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 Fulio murder, these were the sloppiest dudes ever. They were sloppy. The one dude used his mama's car. They is just ridiculous. Redamn-diculous. But um, again, the door is open to Kamala and Trump. Either one of them, if they want to step up. And again, people are like, oh, well, you, you've been talking greasy about Kamala. Yeah, I've, I've talked greasy about Trump. I've talked greasy about all of them. We can still sit down and chop it up. Hell, Kamala talked greasy about Biden, and she are, she's still a part of his campaign. She's still a part of his cabinet. Yeah, people talk greasy about people in the political sphere. And then you make business arrangements. You make business deals. That's called being grown. There ain't no emotion here. Yeah. Um, let me see. This person here is Dan. My, my brother Mikhail is telling me about Dan Scavino Jr. And he is a part. He's the senior advisor to Trump. Dan Scavino. I'm going to see if Dan is following me real quick. Um, but he's a senior advisor to Trump. Um, let me see something. So, yeah, reach out to him, family, to Dan Scavino. Uh, Dan Scavino Jr., is he following me? Because a lot of these people follow me. But he's not following me. But, yeah, Dan Scavino Jr., he's a senior advisor. So y'all reach out to him. Reach out to Trump's people. And I'm going to let them know we want to we want to chop it up. Reach out to Kamala's people and y'all Kamala's people already in here, by the way. So all you Kamala people in here, go to the DNC and let them know the invitation is there. Y'all can stop shilling and let's have a real conversation. Y'all can stop hopping in the comments with your canned talking points. Let's have a real convo here. Let's get busy. Like, right, because it's truth to power time. It's all about truth to power. Again, everybody retweet this broadcast. Um, a lot of people are still talking about the Olympics and that Rachel Gunn lady. And that, that still has me ticked off. Because again, and I'm talking about the white lady who went to the Olympics flopping around like a damn fool. And there's a lot of different stories coming out. Some people are trying to say, they're saying that her and her husband formed some kind of governing body for breaking competitions in Australia and then elected themselves. And that's, she denied access to a lot of more qualified dancers so that she could finesse her way to the Olympics. There, and some people are saying that's true. It's not true. There was, there was some kind of finesse going on. There was some kind of finesse. And also she was allowed to do that. She was allowed to go up there and make a mockery out of our culture. And, and family, I want people to understand how serious that is. Because what, what happened is that woman 
going to the Olympics on the world stage, mocking our culture, that single-handedly delegitimize b-boying. Do y'all understand what that did to the culture? I want people to, because people are kind of laughing at the her antics, but that literally single-handedly just delegitimized b-boying. B-boying now is looked at as a damn joke. They're not bringing it back to the next Olympics, probably not the one in um, 2032 either. They're not, they're not going to bring it back. So they used it to make a big mockery of it. Well, we, we can't downplay the severity of what happened there, that woman flopping around like a damn idiot. That made b-boying and breaking look very bad, man. We got to be very honest about that. For example, if you Google breakdancing, you know, the first thing that comes up is that woman's dumb ass, that Ray Gunn, that's her dance name. If you Google breakdancing right now, her stupid ass comes up. That's the first thing you see. She has now become the face of breakdancing. Her stupid ass antics, that's the face of breakdancing. That was on the largest stage in the world, and that is now the face of it. Let's think about that for a minute. And I think that was deliberate from some insiders at the Olympics to take a piss on our culture like that. I really want us to understand the severity. And this is another thing, because I was arguing with some white supremacists. They were like, oh, it makes her look bad. She don't look bad. That woman is a damn hero in her homeland. Going back to Australia, she's over there. She's a hero to these white people. That don't make her look bad. That don't make her look bad at all because she's not a part of the culture in the first damn place. She went in as an outsider, so she was mocking the culture, so she's getting props just for being on the world stage. This is a come up for her. This is all up for her. Her flopping around like a damn fool it looks dumb to us. That's a come up for her. Y'all understand? Because now she she's officially an Olympian. They credentialed this woman by letting her get on the world stage. She is officially an, an Olympian, even though she lost severely. She's an Olympian. Family, let me tell y'all something. That Rachel Gunn woman, I can almost guarantee they're going to end up making a movie about her. I, what what's the date today? Whatever the date is today, mark that down. I can almost guarantee at some point they're going to make a movie about that woman. It's up for her. It's all up. This woman went from ob obscurity to the world stage. Everybody knows her name. She got her 15 minutes of fame. White people like those kind of stories. And she did it mocking somebody else's culture. See, that's the thing. That's why it's up for her. It's not It's not a bad look for her. She was mocking our culture, and she got on the world stage to do it. Some obscure, nobody-ass woman who worked at a university somewhere, and she's a white feminist, finessed her way to the world stage with all of these qualified um, dancers out here, that woman finessed her way on the world stage and became the face of breakdancing. She is now the face of breakdancing, whether you like that or not. I'm telling you, Google breakdancing, she comes up. And that's going to be etched into the mind of the, the world for the next years to come. She is now the face of breakdancing. And the thing is, man, with, with b-boying and breaking... Uh, this is why I was so adamant about Foundation of Black Americans really having their hands in the decision making in any of these things because they were going out of their way to take us out of the creation story or to have a co-creation story so they could justify giving the keys to the gate to other people so that they can take a piss on the culture. Because the thing is, listen, another thing is with b boying because they've been taking us and minimizing our role in it and having a co-creation story, see, that degrades the integrity of it. Because, look, b-boying and breaking and, and just hip-hop dances in general, they evolve. A lot of people say, well, Black people stop breakdancing. Well, we stop hitting the floor. But the thing is, we never stop hip-hop dancing. 
we've never stopped hip hop, hip hop dancing at all. We just we, we create new dances all the time. We don't have to do dances from 40 years ago as foundational black Americans. We're just that innovative. And the thing is, with the b-boying and the breaking hitting the floor, that had to evolve and it should have evolved into what it was originally supposed to be. It was supposed to be floor moves that accentuated the top moves, which is what we still do. We do top moves in hip hop culture because you got to have rhythm for that. A lot of these people who don't have no rhythm, they had to stick to the floor. And that's why the, the genre kind of got stuck. The genre got stuck between 81 and 85. And again, them doing old outdated dances and not mixing it in with no top dances, you know, that opens the door for a lot of foolery because now if all you got to do is roll on the floor, hell, this goofy white woman from Australia, like, hell, I can do that, which is what she did. There was no rhythm in what that woman did. Not one ounce of rhythm. She got up there and rolled around on the floor for five minutes like a damn fool. You understand what I'm saying? So, yeah, we let other people define what the dancers are supposed to be. It's never supposed to be about rolling on the damn floor nonstop. You're supposed to mix that in with some damn rhythm. You understand? Our brother Charlie Rock said that. One of the original B-boys. You know, so we, we got to be adamant about things that we create and and stomping down on what the rules of these things are supposed to be and not let people join in on the co-creation story when they didn't create it. This is why microphone check is so important. Family, go get the movie microphone check. Go to microphonecheck.com. This is why microphone check was so important so that we could tell the hip hop story with integrity and not have this clown ass nonsense be the face of it. You know what I'm saying? That's why y'all saw me just so adamant about I'm promoting this movie left and right. And we're dealing with these vultures behind the scenes, trying to sabotage it, calling movie theaters. All this so weird. This is why, man. We got to stomp down on things. Well, it's loud as hell outside. Uh, let me get some calls in here. We got a lot of people in here. We got a lot of people in here. So y'all, let me get our good brother Afro Elite in the building. Brother Afro Elite, hop on, sir. I'm here, brother. What's going on with you? Uh, I want to say, I think it was a genius idea for you to invite Donald Trump and Kamala. Yes. I know you've been... Uh, critical of both of them but yes. to be honest it shows a lot of journalistic integrity to be critical of somebody but still to welcome them in your museum to have an interview absolutely, absolutely. so a lot of people are probably going to troll but the fact of the matter is for months people have been saying we haven't had a good enough reach to the Democratic Party, they don't know our demands. We haven't had a sit down conversation with them. This ends all of that. This is an invitation to both parties, non-biased invitation. And if they don't accept it, it's going to be very telling. Yeah. So they know for a fact that they can't get up there and they can't talk about H.R. 40. They won't be able to talk about reproductive rights. They won't be able to talk about black and brown. So this is going to clear all of that stuff up. So I'm glad that you're doing this. Whether they accept it or not, I think it's going to be a good look. Yes, indeed. But man, thank you so much. And yeah, man, it's, it's out there on the table now. And again, they all follow me anyway. All of these folks follow me. The Democrats, they all follow me. The Republicans, they all follow me. The top brass, all of them follow me anyway. And the Democrats, they keep their, their shields and their minions all in our spaces all the time. So look, y'all don't have to do that. Y'all don't have to have these people lurking in our spaces and trying to troll in the comment section. Just get your big dogs up and bring them on down and let's have a conversation with them. These people see the reach and influence we have when they, you know, they see us out there in D.C. with thousands of people standing on reparations business. They see the influence going on here. And let me tell you something, this, if Kamala or Trump sits down and comes to the Hidden History Museum and talks to us, that would be huge for them. 
I'm telling you that would sway the election. If they have a real conversation with somebody who's really respected, who's not married to any party, um, very neutral, very fair, um, everything will have integrity. It won't be no gotcha moments. I'm just going to let them sit there and speak their piece. Let me get my brother Sir Major up here because Sir Major has been sending emails to um, certain people um, within the party. What's up, Sir Major? Where you at, Sir Major? Oh, Sir Major, where you at, bro? Oh, well, Sir Major, something's going on with his phone. I get him back in a minute. I uh, get him back in a minute. Let me get um, oh yeah, let me get um, my brother Maverick. This is my good brother Maverick from the Maverick Approach. What's up, brother Maverick? What's going on, brother? How you feeling? I'm good, man. How you doing, fam? Good, man. Good, man. Yeah, I think this is a genius move as well. Um, I do have a question. If they came to the museum and, you know, say they both came, what would be the first thing that you would ask them? That's what I would want to know. Oh, man, I got a, uh, a million questions. I would just get right to the point. Look, there's been a lot of outreach to the Black community. Um Many Black people within Black America, Black voters, are asking for specific tangibles. What type of specific tangibles could Black America expect if you were president? I just get right to the nitty gritty. And just respectfully. It'd be real respectful. Right. Right. So that, that was the first thing I would ask. And I would ask a lot of other questions. But yeah, that would be the first thing. So yeah, man, we need yeah. to really... Um, I, I would love for them to come on down and talk about these policies. I would absolutely love them to come on down and talk about these policies. Let's get Diz in here. Let's get Diz. What's up, Diz? My bad. What's up, I'm Tariq, dog. I'm from New Orleans. I just want to come here and say my piece to you and tell you that when I was in high school, I first got on the, uh, the Hidden Color series and it changed my life for the better. Love it. Love it. And I love New Orleans, man. I I, I miss New Orleans. Uh, uh, showing love, huh? Yes, indeed, man. I love the energy down there in New Orleans, man. But go ahead, brother. Yeah, and then they have, uh, we also, our mayor just got called for uh, funneling money and uh, objective from what, showing, showing more love to, like, the white folks around here and then gentrifying us and pushing us from the inner city to the east. So, Oh, wow. Like, yeah, her name is Mayor Cantrell. So. <laughs> well, is she a white lady, black lady? What is she? She's a black lady. Oh, okay. wow. Wow. Oh, yeah. They, they probably got one of these boule bootlicks up there doing the dirty work. So you know how they do. But shout out to New Orleans, man. Love it down there. Let's get um, the only Mel Cruz. Mel Cruz. Hey, what's going on, Tariq? Thanks for bringing me up. Yes. A um, couple of things. So your wife is making all that noise because she's trying to make sure, you know, they, they get rid of that milk and stuff. So you're better. I know. Uh, Lord, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, now here's the thing, Tariq. First of all, I think that neither Trump nor Kamala, they're they're probably afraid because in just a general discussion with you, you know that you're going to be able to pull up a historical fact that's going to throw them off. They're not prepared for that. But I think a great strategy for you it would be, and we need this as well, is to bring Kennedy onto your platform. I know I talked to you about it before. Bring yeah. Kennedy onto your platform because once Kennedy does his thing, they're going to feel the need to come through and reaffirm who they are and why they should be voted for. So mm. I think strategically, if you bring him on, then you might get a better response or a quicker response. But also, we as Black Americans, I think we need to have Kennedy uh, sit down with you because of your prominence so yeah. that we can get in here and have him tell us what time it really is. Uh, because I think, to be honest with you, if we were to vote for Kennedy, um, that that is where our voice is really going to be heard. Kamala and Trump are both going to be like, well, damn, what happened? Because mm -hmm. none of them have any Black agenda on either of their platforms. Yeah, yes. And that's a good idea, sister. I'm going to have Ooh. to reach out to Kennedy's folks and um, get him up. Because, uh, again, they've been corresponding with me behind the scenes. Um, so yeah, that, that's a very interesting way to look at it. Um, FBA feet. What's up, brother? 
What's up? What's up, Tariq? Hey, I got a uh, question for you. Display that real quick. What if they say, hey, well, we do a lot of things for the black community. Far as we give money to HBCUs, we do a lot of funding for LGBT. Because <laughs> no, no, I'm pretty no. sure that's going to be their rebuttal. Right, right. That whole, <laughs> the whole HBCU, hey, we're going to remind them that, hey, that that goes to a lot of non-black people because a lot of non-black people go to HBCUs. And what about those of us who are not at HBCUs? Some of us don't go to college. So, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll respectfully clean those questions up. We already know what their talking points are going to be. and We'll clean that up. Um, oh, let me get Sir Major back and see if he's ready. What's up, Sir Major? about the tweet how you doing can you hear me oh, now? i can hear you now there you all go. right cool 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 i just want to personally let you know that uh man great like great minds think of like i was talking to uh a MAGA supporter on yesterday night uh the day before yesterday and i was talking about <clears throat> trying to get trump to do a sit down interview this is crazy and so you put the uh the call to action out you know anytime i see you put something out i'm gonna jump on it um yeah. i actually personally text trump's campaign manager i'm not even okay going through the black lady i'm going directly to the top mm. we're going to really try this is the last thing i do on the app uh we're going to try to damn near uh, get you this this damn uh interview so uh yeah. I, i've got his direct contact i'm texting his iphone this is not a fluke i'm going over my friend's head i'm going straight to the source so we're going to try to make this happen um and i think it's a great look uh, yes this, this is a great look for trump actually if he if he does manage to do this interview uh so we're going to yeah. really we're going to try to put this together. Uh, I, I do want to give a quick update, Tariq, uh, on the case with uh, two cases really quickly. I'll talk fast. Yeah. With the uh, the case of the black, uh, the African nurse who made the despair, disparaging remark, we found out that uh, she is, first of all, she's supposed to be licensed underneath a, uh, a medical doctor. So when you are a nurse practitioner, you're supposed to be working in a collaborative agreement with a medical doctor. You can't just do your own practice by yourself. Come to find out she was not even working through a medical doctor. So she's got some serious problems ahead of her and we're pushing that knife. Uh, now let me change the language. We're pushing the issue on that and keeping uh, our foot on her, um, on her back with that. And then yeah. the other thing is that with the, I don't know if you remember the case out there in Virginia city uh, where the white supremacist guy called the black man an N word and said that he was going to hang him from a tree. Yeah. Okay. So in that case, that guy was actually had a, uh, he got, they, they, all the family members were charged with uh, false uh, statements to a law enforcement officer for trying to obstruct them and getting the facts. And then also there was a hate crime enhancement. So when you talk about creating and being our own ADL, that's what this is about is that when you see these cases, jump on it, um, you know, create the awareness around it. And actually write letters and things like that because yeah. now we got this guy a hate crime enhancement. Good, good. There it is. Perfect, man. Great information, brother. Thank you so much, Sir Major. That's good. Yeah, that situation up there in Virginia City, Nevada, where they were talking about lynching this brother, and is that that it was that that moist dude. He started crying, you know. So yeah, they they arrested those folks, and I'm glad they got some hate crime in enhancements on them that's why we need to get a very specific hate crime bill so that everybody get hit with those hate, hate crime enhancements i saw another case where a white girl used the n-word like 200 times at some university and she got um kicked out the university i think they charged her because she tried to attack somebody though so you know we we really need that hate crime bill and that's another thing i would like to talk to them about trump and kamala I want to holler at them about that. DJ Genesis, what's happening? Uh, hello, uh, Tariq. I'm so glad to be here. So I uh, wanted to make a statement and then ask a question. So the statement I wanted to ask first, uh, say first, is that the hip hop movement has been, uh, was been, had been taken over when the um, Asians took over the DJing and scratching that was happening. And at first it was mostly uh, African uh, uh, FBAs that were running that. And then, it became dominated by the Asians and they yeah. also have dominated the actual dancing now too. And then France, the reason why France is like so big and it became a thing in the um, Olympics was because France has the DJ, I mean the dancing battles over there 
and they've been keeping like that dancing thing alive in Europe and 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 things like right. that. We right, we like abandoned that whole thing, so it's kind of weird to be mad about it when we abandoned it and now they're take they've kept it alive and now we're mad, you know. So that's the only. Well, well, know. the thing is, I, and look, and I've seen some of the French the competitions over there in France, so they they managed to put some cool up rock stuff in there, and they it's they they keep it rhythmic. But I get what you're saying. Yeah, they do have a lot of those competitions over there. But again, when they're putting this thing on the world stage and they're not acknowledging the people who created it, even though we don't do the floor moves like that as foundational black Americans, this is still something that we created and we created it for a reason. We didn't create it for some goofy Australian woman to make a damn mockery out of it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, Her, right, exactly. Jump around like a goddamn kangaroo and all of that bullshit. Well, she actually oh. did better in her actual, uh, when she was uh, trying out for the Olympics. I don't know why she did what she did once she actually got on the stage. That was wild. Uh, dude, there's, please, there's no justification for what she did. Uh, my children can dance better than what she did on that damn stage. There's nothing to justify that. She shouldn't have never been nowhere near that. And I've seen some other videos of her. She's not that good nowhere. There's nothing good about what that woman does. Nothing. She should not have been nowhere near an Olympic stage. She shouldn't have been nowhere near a talent show locally. She's horrible. So that's what it is. Where do you DJ, by the way, Genesis? Uh, I um I'm from Detroit, so I DJ a little bit of everything. But I started off as a techno, and you know, te- you know, techno come from Detroit black people, and mm-hmm. I started off as a techno DJ, traveling around the world, like being a techno DJ, and then now I just DJ everything. So, oh yeah, oh yeah, that Shari Bari songs and all that was big yeah, in Detroit. Yeah, Shari yeah. Bari. Yeah. Oh, that was so, yeah, that was. That was but the I shit started right. off as a scratch DJ, like an actual um. That's how I know, because I started off being an actual DJ that did the beat mixing and all that stuff like that, but then it became dominated by the Asians, and you couldn't necessarily beat them because most of the DMC competitions would end up in Asia, and it was weird. Like, and then they had this. It was weird how they just. Have you worked with radio stations out there in Detroit? Yeah. Yep. I worked with uh, WJLB. Oh, they're still around. JLB is still around. They back. You know, I'm I'm old. (laughs) I'm forty six. Yeah, you you remember Mojo? Yeah, yeah, Electrify Mojo, yes, for sure. What happened to him? Well, I think that when the program directors came into the fold, uh, because he would be able, the thing was, he was always a record breaker. He would, yeah, he was. He broke a lot of prints at the time and all that. When Clear Channel took over and Radio One, they got program directors, and then program directors like kind of took over, and you could no longer just pick the record, so it got rid of like DJs like him that were known for like, just like playing and, and breaking records. So, Oh yeah. Yeah. So, (laughs) but I have a question too. That's a little bit like off subject. Go ahead, dear. So I've been a pan Africanist for over like, well, dang, they're almost 20 years. Mm -hmm. And I got introduced into it by a Sarah suit and Seti. I'm not sure if you know him. I know that Seti's out there in Detroit. So I don't know. Yeah, of course. Right. I was actually his web developer of the black, black power cartel. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, I um so I I I became into African spirituality and I now I practice Ifa. Most recently the the king of the Oyotunji village uh passed away and it was like the first African village um that existed on American soil the the actual Yoruba African village he was like a king the only king on in America and he just recently passed away July 29th. Do you think with this FBA movement, do you think that this marks the end of Pan-Africanism and the death of like the whole Pan-Africanism movement? Pan-African were, were in most of your um, actual Hidden Colors movies. I watched all of them. Mm-hmm. Um, so where do you think Pan-Africanism fits into the FBA movement? Is it dead? What do you think? Well, the thing is, was Pan-Africanism really alive? Because it's been one-sided all this time. See, it was never really, to be honest... It was never a big thing. It's been something that we've been fantasizing about. It's been something that we, on this side, we've been really promoting. But we just we just woke up and just got very honest. Because in warfare, you just got to be honest about warfare. We've been the only ones upholding the mantle of white of a of pan Africanism against the system of white supremacy because we understand white supremacy because we're living among the major white supremacists. 
some of the African brothers and sisters and Caribbean brothers and sisters because there's a black face on white supremacy. They know how to put black puppet leaders over there. They don't look at white supremacy the way we do. Um, and in fact, many of them, we just got to be very honest, they low-key worship white people. White people are damn gods when they show up. And we got to really understand that we can't get any pan-Africanism out of that. That's why we can't get nothing going on on the continent over there in large numbers. When we try to go over there and um, build something, we got to go over there with a gang of money and black folks are going over there getting finesse left and right. So it's um, it's it's a vibe. It's a, it's a real bad vibe, man, that we said, hey, enough is enough. We're going to focus on building what we got over here, getting our stuff together. Because another thing, um, we think that there's some kind of white supremacy free area that we can eventually go to. And Africa is not that. The Caribbean is not that. Um, these were places that were colonized, remixed, and their history is shorter than ours. We think that we're they got some kind of missing history that we got to be a part of. No, they've been remixed more than we have. We are more deeply rooted over here than they are there. Our history is more deeply rooted and rich. Those countries are relatively new. They have been colonized over and over and over again remixed over and over again. These tribes have been mashed up together. So nobody really knows their real origin stories over there no more. Uh, again, when we brought Hidden Colors over there, a lot of that information was new to them too. They didn't know a lot of that information about the history of those African nations. So that's not to denigrate them. And us looking at our FBA lineage, that's not to denigrate them either. We do have brothers and sisters in Africa and the Caribbean who are riders, and I still love them, got much love for them. I got brothers and sisters over in Zimbabwe, I got nothing but love for them. Brothers and sisters out there in South Africa, nothing but love for them. Um, but the thing is, we want them to start getting their pan-Africanism together on the continent. And well, let me tell you this. This is going to this is, this is blow your mind. So since the passing of the king of Oyotunji, right, now the Yoruba, so the, so the Yoruba community in, in, in Dallas, uh, what I'm finding out is that they have been installing kings. Uh, they've been coming over here because he had, because the, the only king in America, based on the culture, has the actual, you know how it's all about like having the relic or whatever it is to be able to only a king can make a king. So a lot of Yorubas have been coming over to Oyotunji to become kings in America. So there's actual Yoruba kings that come from Africa. When they come to America, they pay a certain price to become a king in their certain city, and that creates their own community. It's interesting that, that that's been happening this whole time, and I, and I just now found out about it. It's been happening undercover I just found out that they have been installing kings, and there's really a, a lot of money. But involved. but the thing, but yeah, but the thing, this they're powerless. It's symbolic, sister. These are symbolic. They have no type of royalty power, no type of political power, no type of empire or kingdoms that they are running. So that's just symbolic. Because uh, uh, that happens, like, you go over there to certain African countries and they do this thing where they make you a king over there. That don't mean anything. I mean, okay, that's symbolic. You don't really have any type of power to kind of call no shots. You know what I'm saying? And I we I don't want to do no symbolic stuff. I'm done with the symbolic gestures. Um, you know, they, basically, I, I can be Burger King and have more power than that. We don't, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> So, so yeah, we're not, it's, it's all in name. It's a symbolic nothing burger. So that's what it is. But thank you so much, beloved. Thank you so much, dear. I appreciate you. Yeah, all that King of Zamunda bullshit. No, that's another thing. We ain't trying to hear that either. Cat's coming over. I am a prince, nigga. Okay. Take me to the airport in this Uber and stop playing, prince. You know what I'm saying? You are the king of Uber. <laughs> And no, no disrespect. <laughs> no disrespect at all. But, you know, you're in the kingdom of Wendy's. You're a Wendy's manager. You know, let's just keep it above. D mood. D mood something. D mood somebody. Where you at, man? 
the mood. I don't know what your name is, brother. I'm not going to keep calling your damn name like I'm goddamn candy, man. Let's get my brother Black Alpha in here. Black Alpha in the building. I'm good, man. How are you, sir? I'm doing good, brother. I just got to tell you that this invitation to Kamala and Donald Trump is brilliant. It's one of the best political chess moves that I've seen come from our people in a long time because it allows us now to be political free agents opposed to political property. Yes, indeed. Absolutely. You know, now, yeah, brother. And I, I love the idea when I first seen the flyer. I love the idea so much because now you set the precedence that the black American community, we're open for business. We're going to exercise all options and we're going to go where our interests go. That's empowerment, brother. So salute to you always, fam. Much respect. And absolutely, man. Listen, like I said, I'm nonpartisan. I'm, I'm not rolling. See, again, if either one of the politicians want to come down to the Hidden History Museum and have a real conversation, let's stop setting up these little janky fake barbershops and all of that. Let's stop all that. Let's not have a twerk contest. Let's, let's not get the Tim Scotts and all of these goofballs. Let's, let's have a real conversation with the black community. For real, for real. And let's talk policy. That's all I want to do is talk policy. What kind of policies you have? I ain't doing none of the gotcha stuff. We're not going to do all that. Well, you had said somebody, well, you're going to grab him by the coochie. Yeah, yeah, we ain't going to do that. Even with Kamala, we're not going to do no gotchas with Kamala. We're not, we're not doing that. We're, let's, we're moving forward. We're looking at policy. All I want to know, we're not going to go into the Willie Brown. We ain't doing none of that. We're not going to do no gotchas. Let's let's move forward and talk about your policies for us in the future. What do you have planned? And why should we galvanize in large numbers to support either one of you? We're going to have a real conversation. The invitation is out there and everybody needs to boost the invitation so they can't say they don't know about it. They can't duck and dodge. You understand? So they can't say... Um, they don't know what we wanted to talk about. We're open to discuss what needs to be discussed for black people, particularly foundational black Americans. We're open to hear what can be brought to the table from either side. And I've been critical of both sides. Now, Kamala Harris has a come to Jesus moment and says, you know what? I've been thinking about it and I want to I got a tangible program for grants or land, whatever, specifically for foundational black Americans, Kamala will get my vote immediately. If Kamala says she has something specific and tangible for the black community, she has my vote. She has my full support. If Trump comes through and says, hey, I got some job programs, some grants, some tangibles, for the black community, Trump will get my support. If Trump comes through and gives a plan that he has for the black community where we can get tangible benefits, I will put my full support behind Trump. So either one of them, let me know what's on your mind. And I'm neutral. I'm not married to any party. And a lot of black people, we're open. A lot of us are not just jumping around for catfish nuggets. Because the Democrats are shaking the bucket. No, no, no. A lot of us are open-minded out here. Let's get Doctor. Um, let's get Doctor Shahad in the building. Doctor Shahad, hop in, sir. I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, sir. Doctor Shahad, hop on. Unmute your microphone, Doctor Shahad. If you are trying to legitimately get on, unmute your microphone, sir. All right. Well, let's get Dylan, um, Dylan Sachs. Dylan Sachs, hop in. Hey, right, Dylan, hop in. Hey, what's going on, Rick? How you doing? I'm good, brother. Dylan, what's going on with you, fam? Man, cool and good talking to you again. I uh, rap with you out DC when you was out for the rally for reparations. Oh, yeah. Um, man, look, like, I think this is a good move. I was just in the space earlier, and I was telling people, like, that's one thing that both parties are missing. 
normally looking at the lower class or the um i guess the lower middle class everybody's focused on the upper middle class or the higher class and it's like if you really want to get this vote come walk through the neighborhoods come talk to us i seen an interview with joe biden and he was talking about yeah you know we don't really walk through the projects anymore because it's dangerous and you know it's just not safe and i thought that shit was weird because if you really want this vote man give us an anti-black uh hate crime bill or give us reparations you'll be in power for the next couple of decades it's simple it's it like and then with kamala it's like you're already in office right now you could literally write an executive order right now and get us out the way and win the election but they rather ignore us ignore the majority of people than just to give us a fucking bill oh man excuse me for that but just to give us a bill you get what i'm saying and we're getting lynched in these streets every single day we should have been the first people to have a hate crime bill before anybody we're literally getting lynched in uh, the media every single day. You could cut on the news, any channel, anywhere in America, and see what's happening to our people. But, um, and also, one more point before I go. Uh, yeah. So when I heard DJ talking about, uh, you know, the Asians dominated, breaking, and it's on to the other culture, I knew it was sun because I don't believe in Pan-Africanness because if y'all really wanted to help Africa, just go to Africa and help them build up. You get what I'm saying? Because I noticed a lot of Pan-Africanists, they're in America talking this go back to Africa, but nobody's going to Africa. You know, and yeah. with the uh, breaking, it's like uh, we got breaking. Now, main, mind you, it might not be our main dances. You know what I'm saying? But we got like, shout out to Cash Gains with a K. It's a lot of breaking still going on in America. It was no reason the USA wasn't supposed to have a goal. It wasn't um, no black Americans in that contest, or it wasn't no black American judges. Right. But on that, I'm going to land. Thank you so much, brother. Yeah, man, they should have been some, at least some of the pioneering judges. That's what I was trying to get them on there. Okay, let's get um Turka. Let's get Turka in here. And Turka has a Somalian flag. What's up, Turka? <clears throat> Turka, unmute your microphone, sir. <clears throat> Good evening, everybody. Can you guys hear me? How's yeah. my uh? We can hear you. How are you, brother? I'm fine. How's everybody tonight? We are good, man. What's on your mind? I'm just here to observe and maybe chime in a little. What's the topic tonight? Um, we're talking about Trump and Kamala and possibly getting a sit down with them to talk to us about policies for black people. That's what the main topic is. Who... Well, Trump already. Trump, I think Trump is more willing to sit down than Kamala is, uh, as far as I know. Right? A lot of people are saying that. A lot of people are saying that Trump will would be more willing to sit down. <clears throat> and that's fine. I put out an invitation to both of them to come down to the Hidden History Museum and talk to us about policies, because I'm nonpartisan. I'm neutral. I'm not committed to any party. I'm policy driven. So if either one of them want to come and sit down and discuss policies, I'm all ears and the black community is all ears. Um, how long have you been over here from Somalia, Turka? Uh, uh, 37 years. 37 years, okay. Have you been back over there to um, kind of bring some of the family members back or help them out over there? Oh, no, man. Uh, no, I was a kid when I came here. I, oh. I didn't have to go through all that. Got it, got it. I feel you. Okay, my man. Well, thank you so I'm, much. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty well assimilated, if, if that's uh, the term you want to use. Oh, there you go. There you go. I I, I completely understand. But thank but you I so have, much. But to answer your question, I have been to Africa. Uh, several African countries have been. Uh, after, I'm well-traveled, to, to say oh, the least. There you go, my man. I right, thank you so much, man. I appreciate you. All right, let's get, um. what's this guy's name? Bullish Pizza. Hello, can you hear me? 
Yes, I can hear you, man. What's up, brother? Go ahead, Bullish. Oh, he bounced. Okay, let's get Miss Lauren. Miss Lauren, hop on, Miss Lauren. Hey, how you doing, Tariq? Nice talking to you. Absolutely. I uh, I did go, I went to your rally in Freedom Plaza. Uh, it was quite good. <laughs> it was, it was just good that you did that. I Thank was you. Uh, no problem. I was uh, curious just to know uh, what you might focus on if you got uh, an interview, particularly uh, for Vice President Harris. Um, there's so much to focus on, as you know, but I was wondering, you know, what might be the point of focus? It's a good idea. It's a great idea. Yeah, yeah, really. I, I'm, I'm going to focus on just tangibles for us specifically. What are you going to do for the black community? Why should we be galvanized to vote for either one of you? It's going to be strictly the black community, none of that minority stuff. Um, we want to talk about how the black community needs tangibles. We've been attacked. I want to talk about the Freedmen's Bank. Oh, no, there's a lot of stuff I want to talk about. Oh, there's a lot of stuff I want to talk about. Yeah. So we're going to get into it. We're going to really get into that 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 conversation. The, the, the name of the game is about us getting tangibles and empowerment. All right. Let's get... um. Mouse Tony, Mouse Tony. What's up, Mouse Tony? Hop on. All right. While we're waiting on Mouse Tony, we'll get Joseph Pierre in the building. Mouse, Joseph, Joseph, where you at, man? All right. Let's try Fox. All right, Fox. All right, y'all people are requesting and y'all ain't saying nothing. Let's get the Fuhrer. Oh, oh, hello. I'm sorry, I was muted. Okay, uh, Fox. Can you, can, you, can you hear me? I can hear you, Fox. How are you? I just want to... to I, I'm from Norway, okay? I live, oh. uh, But I'm originally from the Philippines, where it's actually Americanized, if you understand, <laughs> because of the wars <laughs> that happened there. Uh, okay. So I have I have uh, knowledge about your politics, but I'm not here to infringe on anything. Okay, I just want to I just want to say some stuff. If if, if it's okay for you, go ahead. It's okay. For okay. You. The thing is that I love Trump. I think I think the left is bad right now. But um, the thing is, you know, in Norway we have an egalitarian system, right? Uh, people mistake us to be to be a socialism and stuff like that. That's fucked up. That's bullshit. We are social egalitarian, uh, but we are uh, social democratic and economic. Basically, we we are the most economic in the in the world. <laughs> we, we we own BlackRock for for fuck's sake. Uh, uh, Norwegian NBIM that no. Look it up. Google it. N B I M that N O. Uh, this Norwegian oil oil fund, we we diverse over the world basically. Okay. We 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 earn money, but we help other countries also with that. And there's no problem with that. Uh, USA can do that too. But the thing is, and uh, I love Trump, but under his under administration, they printed a lot of trillions of dollars. Uh, to, to, that, that made you guys and our economy in Norway also to suck because the, all the central banks are connected, right? When your when your fucking Federal Reserve prints money out of monopoly tin air, what happens then? Yeah, our money here also becomes zero, right? Everything uh, suddenly my my stake costs more than than it should, right? I'm angry. Right. Okay. But the thing is, RFK is the answer, in my opinion, because he's actually the one who has the, who has the answers. But, but, but then again, I hope that uh, Trump and RFK actually goes, uh, you know, I, I, in my dream, uh, Trump should be president and RFK should be vice president. <laughs> oh, all right. well, thank you so much. Let me land your plane. He's kind of all over the place. 
Um, and speaking of RFK, some people are saying that he might support Kamala. He might throw his support behind her. There was a rumor about that. So I don't know. I don't know. Um, Mouse, Tony, you good? All right, let me get Mouse out of here. Um, KKK person. All right, hop in, KKK. KKK or DeFuro? Which one do you guys want to get on? Either one of you can unmute your microphone. And let me get y'all out of here since you're not saying anything. All right. And again, I'm not going to be on too, too long. I got to do an interview with the LA Times tomorrow. They wanted to do one with me tonight. And I'm still kind of getting over my milk situation. And they wanted to it's a, they wanted to film me. And I'm not camera ready right now. I look crazy. So I got to get trimmed up and get my look together and all that good stuff. <laughs> so I'm doing that tomorrow morning. So I ain't going to be on too, too late. Let's get, um, um, y'all raise your hand if y'all want to get on. Raise your hand if you're ready to get on. What's up, Yoshi G? I see you down there, dear. I see you, Yoshi. Um, let me see. Y'all raise your hand if y'all ready. All right, let's get, um, let's get Nick, the Ghanaian Haitian. Let's get Nick, the Ghanaian Haitian. Let's hear what he has to say. What's up, Nick? How's it going, my man? I'm good. What's going on with you, Nick? Good. Your family is doing good? Oh, yeah. The family is great, man. How's everything? You're in Florida, right? No, sir. Jersey. Jersey. Okay. I don't know why I thought you were in Florida. But... So what's going on, man? What's the Democrats telling you guys to oh, talk to? Oh, no, please. Well, I'm progressive. I'm not. I'm not. You've never seen me, like, post anything about the I mean, Democrats or Republicans, so that that's not who I am. So who yeah. you voting for? Uh no one. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm I'm somewhere in the middle, so I'm not sure yet. But I have a question for you though. Go ahead. Um when do you ex well are you certain that reparation will be passed? Oh yes it's coming. It, eventually it's gonna have to come because um, we're stomping too hard for it. It's already in the lexicon, and we can't go back on it. It's, you just can't let the subject um, just disappear. We're standing on reparations too heavy at this point. So eventually, it's going to have to be paid. Absolutely. But if you're certain, shouldn't you have a date as to when it will happen? Because with certainty comes date, right? To, to disambiguate. Uh, you know, the uncertainty, you must have a date. For example, you're going to no. end space soon. No, yes. sir. Yes, no. sir. No, you don't. Sir, you're going to take a crap tomorrow. You don't know what time you're going to do it, but you're going to do it. You don't know what exact time. It's going to come. It's certainly going to come. You don't know the exact time. So certain things, you know it's coming. You don't know the exact date, but it's coming. It's going to happen. You understand? Absolutely. I think I have a right. few questions, but... Go ahead. Uh, yeah, 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 but what I'm saying is, would you have an approximation as to when, like, for example, like 10 years from now, 5, 20, approximately? I don't know, son. I don't know. I don't know, but it's going to come. Why? Why is this whole thing about the approximation of the time? Why? What's that about? No, because it, it was certain, like I said before, I, I, I would like uh, to know when it's going to happen because why because you're not even qualified to get it you're, you're not qualified on no size of your family to even get it so why the approximation of the time frame why is that important to you no but i am for it i'm not against it I, at all i never was why never will be of the approximate time frame and you're not even qualified to get it why is that because you you're some people are putting their life on hold to wait for it no they're and, not Oh, no, come they, on, dude. Uh, you have people that are hosting spaces 24 7. Nobody's putting their life. What are you talking? Nobody's putting their life on hold waiting for reparations. You, life yeah. goes on. No, yeah. nobody's putting their life on hold. Nobody, nobody's stopping paying their bills, stopping going to work, stopping going to school, waiting on the reparations in the mail. Nobody, literally, nobody's doing that. Nobody's. Another, another question for you, sir, before I. Uh, you... But. but but you're saying stuff that's such in bad faith. But, but, but it is true. You do know that there are people that are hosting space in perpetuity and they never end it. It's like 24-7. 
when the market is open to all. But I have another question for you. Am but I that considered... doesn't mean that they're putting their life on hold. They're discussing something in the middle of living life. That's what we're doing now. I'm discussing reparations and tangibles. My life isn't on hold. I'm still no, no, absolutely not. You're a multimillionaire, so you're making money as you're speaking to people, which is my mentality. So absolutely not. I'm not referring to you. But I have one more question for you, though. Go ahead, sir. Am I considered to be black? Well, you're not a foundational black American. I would look at you as a black person. I do personally. I would see you. Okay, that's a black person. You're just not a foundational black American. So I am black by definition of the word yeah. black. I would I would consider you a black person. There were some who say, well, the only foundational black Americans could use the black title. Um, there were historically different words for black, like even more, the term more, that meant black. And they would call the black people Moors based on how they looked. Then they started using Negro, um, the Spanish. So, you know, there were people being referred to as black historically um, in other places in the world. I think a lot of people feel a certain way about the term black because a lot of you guys, y'all don't refer to yourselves as black unless it's convenient. Because for years we've heard People from Haiti, people from West Africa, people from East Africa say, oh, I'm not black, I'm Nigerian. Oh, I'm not black, I'm Jamaican. Oh, I'm not black, I'm Haitian. So even though you have melanated skin, a lot of you are black when it's convenient. So this is why we designate what's the foundation of black American. See, that's what I'm looking at when I see a melanated person. I want to know what's your lineage are you a foundational black American? And then we can kind of operate from there. That makes sense? Yes, absolutely. And you said one more thing, uh, Tariq. I think you said not so long ago, you said that you went to Ghana and they were forcing you to, uh, like you wanted to build or something of that nature. I don't want to misquote you. And they were giving you pushback. Not that I've ever been there or to Haiti, but the whole thing is... Uh, there is a sister on YouTube that makes videos, which I, I will send a link to you, um, of people that are coming from the U.S. that go to Ghana, build multiple facilities without getting pushed back from the government. So I don't understand how can your experience be different from theirs if you went there with the right intentions. No, I've never been to Ghana. So the, the the Ghana thing, that wasn't me. I've never said that. I've never been to Ghana. Um, I tried to get some stuff. I was trying to help some people in Haiti, and then they turned it into a big finesse. So, yeah, that didn't go through. But um, we've heard horror stories from a lot of foundational Black Americans going over to Ghana and being finessed and being pillaged and having these little janky deals. Yeah, there might be some good deals going on, but we've heard a bunch of horror stories coming from there too. So that's what I'm saying. And my point is we got to go over there with the bag. Um, also, we keep hearing about foundational black Americans being taxed for more money. They charge them more than they charge the locals. So we, we've heard a lot of horror stories going on over, and over there. So this is why I'm really focused on building and empowering the community here. And when, you know, brothers and sisters are over there really ready to do some good business, when they get rid of all those tribalisms and really get some numbers on the board over there, then we can say, hey, let's look into that pan-African thing again. So you, you feel me? Much love, man. Thank you so much, bro. But uh, thank you for allowing me to speak, bro. Lo much love. Thank you for not calling me names as usual. <laughs> no, no, no. What? I don't never call you names. I never call you names when you call up. I'm very respectful. 100%. Yes. Love, right, man. You. Have a good yeah, one. Right? Yeah, I might get on your, your hairline every now and then. That hairline is janky. So. And on the new album that we got, um, there's a single called Janky Hairline. There is a single on the album called Janky. <laughs> the new album that we got from the group Flextro. There is a song, I'm going to be very honest. The song is called Janky Hairline. We got a lot of great songs on the album. Um, you've already heard the song Musty Tether. That's on YouTube. The Musty Tether song, that's a favorite. Um, we got a song, a very nice song called Forehead Forever. Beautiful song. We got some great songs on there. 
great, great songs. Um, you got another song called Cake Soap Love. Um, phenomenal songs. Phenomenal, <laughs> phenomenal songs. You know, let me, I'm going to let y'all even, hold on. I'm going to give y'all an exclusive little snippet of the janky hairline song. Hold on. Since I'm thinking about old boy who called up. Hold on, let me, I'm going to give y'all an exclusive snippet of the Janky Hairline song. And these are bangers, man. Some of these songs are like, these are bangers. These are club, like songs you can bump in the club. Hold on, hold on. This is this is for the caller who had just called up. It has that mink slide feel. So like I said, we got bangers, man. <laughs> so yeah, we got some bangers, man. This is this album is real tight. We got some real good bangers on there, man. We got some bangers on there. So yeah, that's gonna be coming in a couple of weeks. Um, let's get um, what's your name, Annie? It's Anya. <laughs> I, I, Anya, there you go. Yeah. Hey, How you doing? Uh, I'm doing I'm doing very well, thank you. Um, how are you doing? I'm good, Anya. Where are you from, by the way? I'm from New Orleans. Okay, there you go. Are you Creole? Uh no, no, I'm not. I'm actually um Irish mostly, but so I kinda wanted to give a little bit of a rundown of my experience and ask a question. Go ahead. So my mama left my dad and me when I was three months old and my dad remarried a black woman by the name of Sharice and by all intents and purposes she was my mama, right? Okay. Like, she raised me. I was always with her family, um, you know, and there was a lot of love in my house, you yeah. know, like, I knew her as my mother. Mm -hmm. And um, I, being a kid growing up, I, you know, I was over, I was always over by her parents' house, her, my grandparents, and um, I never remembered everything being so divisive as it is nowadays. I feel like a lot of this stuff has gotten just increasingly worse, and just there's, like, I, and I feel like this is like <sighs> spread around through, you know, media and everything else. And I understand there, trust me, I live in the South, like people are racist in the world, but most people are not racist. Right. And I feel like, I feel like now they're like dividing us. So they're trying to make, you know, like black people hate white people and white people hate black people. And I feel like it's gotten increasingly worse over the last 10 years. And I feel like it's just doing, well, like we're doing ourselves a disservice when we entertain it because I feel like this is just the government, like our government is trying to divide us so they can kind of do their own little bull, you know, their own bullshit. You know what I'm saying? Okay. And yeah. And I was just wondering like what you thought about that. If you thought that it's increased or has it always been that way for you? Cause, yeah, cause I don't, I don't yeah. remember that. Yeah, well, we live in you know, we live in a global system of white supremacy, and unfortunately, that system permeates all areas of activity. It it affects our schools, it affects the the medical, system, it affects the economic. System. So um, we deal with it every day. It's mm -hmm. ingrained in the system, unfortunately, and we unfortunately, as black people, we get the short end of the stick. So we don't have the luxury to kind of ignore that. We have to acknowledge that this system is affecting how we live. So this is why we work to replace the system of white supremacy with the system of justice. That's what we're doing, trying to replace that system so we can have an equitable system. But yeah, it, it hasn't just increased in, in the last 10 years. It's always been there. It's been there. Um, as a person who's white, you you don't feel it like we do um, yeah. because you're not a victim of it. Um, 
And when we have to deal with it on a daily basis, um, you see it when you go around your, your black relatives. That's the only time you might see it or when you're around them. But when you're by yourself, you don't see it. You see, but yeah, we feel it. <laughs> So that's we, we, that's what I was that's kind of like the point that I was trying to make is like when I go around my black relatives like they don't that I don't feel like uh you know they have at least never expressed that to me you know what I'm saying like they never you know um acted like they were uh they had a worse off life than what my dad had you know what I mean because my my dad came from like war torn Ireland and like between the Protestants and the Catholics and blah 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 and like there was an issue with the way he grew up. And like, she actually had a uh, a better upbringing than my dad did, right? You know what I mean. And, a lot uh, of us, a lot of us do, but we're still, but as white people, they still have protections that we don't have. You understand? There's there's still right. benefit protections that we don't get, even if we have a better upbringing, even if we are even financially well off, better than a certain white society. They still have the. Uh, what I call a million dollars worth of white, and that has somewhat of a monetary value. So there's a lot of stuff going on with your phone, dear. Are you still in New Orleans, by the way? You still live in New Orleans? Or you yes, else? yes, sir. Oh, okay, there you go. Well, mm-hmm. shout out to New Orleans, and thank you so much. There's a lot of stuff going on with your phone, dear. There's a lot of stuff going on with that phone. Uh, how many folks we got in here? Okay, damn, we almost got 1,200 people in the building tonight. And by the way, family, um, if you're in L.A., come down to the Hidden History Museum tomorrow. Um, it will open tomorrow, Friday and Saturday. Come on down, man. Get you some books. Get you some deodorant. Get you some flags. Get you some gifts or whatever. Just come on down and visit the Hidden History Museum at 2131 West Jefferson Boulevard here in Los Angeles. Come on down. Let's get Mads in the building, Brother Mads. Hey, Tariq, how are you, brother? Can you hear me clearly? Um, yes, sir. And what's on your mind, brother? Uh, I spoke to you before, so thanks again for giving me the chance to speak to you. Um, I'm the guy from Sudan. Okay, uh, there you go. Yeah, so I, I want to talk. I wanted to answer your question here. Who do you think will sit down with Tariq Nasheed first? I think honestly, you have a better chance sitting down with Trump more than you do with Kamala, right? And mm. the reason that I say that is because he comes from the same cabinet where we have information about how the president himself, Biden, was basically getting handpicked interviewers to talk to him as well. So I wouldn't be surprised if they're doing the same thing for her. And I love when you said um, how there are, especially when it comes to Africans from my community, that handpick themselves. Basically, they say that they're black when it's convenient. Right. right? Yeah. And I think that's OK. You, you can openly, honestly admit that there's a disconnect between Africans, especially Africans that come to America. And oh, yeah. yeah, and foundational black Americans. Right. And oh, yeah. it's it's sad to see because I come from a diaspora where many of my people say that would would tell you I'm Arab before they tell you I'm African. Right. And right. I'm always, yeah. And I'm always fighting for that and saying, no, we're not Arab. We're Nubian. We're descendants of Nubians. We were just colonized by Arabs. But that's another debate. But as far as um this question here. Yeah, I think with Kamala, I mean, she's quoted saying I'm not going to do something to only benefit black people. Right. With, right. Yeah, right. Like, Right. With a nasty anger behind it to where, why not? Why wouldn't you? Because even in like in the perfect world where there was no racism or anything, then fine. You can complain about that and say, well, that's not fair. You shouldn't only do something. But when you talk about black people, black Americans in general, the fact that they didn't start in the same line as far as white Americans did. Right. And if you look at as far as her immigration record, you have over 16. We have about 16 million illegal immigrants that are in the country now. Right. Yeah. And if you look at, for example, they, I feel like she cares more about the illegal immigrants than she does the black community. And the reason I say that is because um, she's letting in all these illegal immigrants, right? You have reports where illegal immigrants are getting cards, like $350 gift cards to use weekly. Yeah. Uh, and, st- and they've been shipped to states like New York, states like Chicago, um, places that are majority um, cities that are majority Democrat first, but are majority African-American community as well. And you had a big African-American community in Chicago that was against that, that actually went to uh, and complained in Chicago and said that these new migrants that are coming in, they're getting treated better than we are. Because if you look at, right. for example, yeah, if you look at, for example, homelessness in America, a third of homeless, um, the homeless veterans in America are African-Americans. These are people that yeah. served in the war. These are people that gave up their livelihood to fight for this country. Why don't you do something for them? Why don't you speak out for them? Why don't you do something to only benefit them? Right. Because they deserve it. They deserve it more than 
new because I'm speaking as an immigrant himself who got lucky with a chance to come to America. Because if you look at my country now and what's happening in Sudan, God forbid if mo most of my family fled to Egypt and Ethiopia. Yeah, you know what I'm saying so. I appreciate the fact that I'm in America. I appreciate the fact that my father filled out the paperwork and waited for his opportunity to come. And I don't appreciate the fact that other people are jumping in line. I don't appreciate the fact that Africans come here and talk down to Black Americans, right? As if they're better than them when we came from lesser, like from something that's not very good. You know what I'm saying? But right. go ahead, Tariq. Sorry. Yeah. Well, we have real talk, man. You echoing a lot of talking points that we've made, and again, it's all about respect. And uh, again. We want tangibles for a lot of the black people who, who are veterans. Like I got a lot of veterans in my family and we shouldn't have all of these homeless vets out here. That's ridiculous when we have all of these people being flooding, flooding in the zone and they're papering them up. Let's get Il Ju Jiganu. Yo, what's going I'm on? Good, man. How are you? I'm doing fine, man. Another day in paradise. You know, where are you from, brother? Uh, well, I'm from the West Coast, but my parents are originally from Ethiopia. There you go. Okay, a lot of East African cats in here tonight. So, what's on your mind, bro? Yeah, man. Um, I just wanted to see. Did you get a chance to see that uh, video where that Arab girl is talking about um, Black Americans contribute to the oppression of Palestinians and all that yeah, crap? Yeah, I saw that. I, I discussed that last night. Yeah, so I already discussed that. So that yeah, um, yeah, I had a big discussion about that last night. So yeah, that's a nothing burger. Uh, let's get, um, let me see, North. Let me see. Let's get North. North. And you're from, um, are you from South Africa, North? Okay. Where are you from, North? I, I told you I'm from Compton. Oh, okay. Okay. Because all the flags be throwing me off. Okay. Yes. So what's going on? Uh, no, I had a question. Um, who are you supposed to debate on uh, Van Lathan's podcast? No, who told you that? Oh, because they said they wanted to invite you for a debate. So I was wondering who you're going to debate on the podcast. No, I, I haven't heard that. I haven't heard that. Van is my guy. Who do they want me to do debate? To debate on and debate. Well, what? He, he said there was a a guy online. He said that uh, we should eliminate Tariq Nasheed. And Van said that we should have a debate on the podcast. So I thought he reached out to you already. He said he wanted to eliminate me from what? Uh, speaking, I guess. Okay, how are they going to do that? I don't know. Well, he, well he, they said they wanted you to debate on the podcast. Okay. So I thought he reached out. Um, No, no. And I'm like, I'm trying to figure out this caller. They're talking about eliminate me from speaking? I, I guess. That, that don't make no sense. But what's going on with you, North? What's happening with you? No, I just had that question. Okay. All right, but thank you so much. All right. All right. Shout out to Van Lathan. Van is my guy. But yeah, I don't know about no debate. All right. All right. We got a lot of people in here, and I hope y'all have your root work deodorant at rootworkstyle.com. And um, everybody, you can go to hiddenhistorymuseum.com, hiddenhistorymuseum.com, and get the book that we have. We have a beautiful children's book called Hidden Heroes from A to Z. This is a phenomenal book for your children and for young adults too. And for older adults that gives you an introduction to a lot of unsung black icons. All right, we talk about John Horse. We talk about A.G. Gaston, who's one of the richest black men in the country in the 1950s and 60s. Little tidbits, easy to read tidbits about Historic Black Figures. Very good book. Very, very good book. Hidden Heroes from A to Z. And it's a good read for little children, big children, teenagers. It's a book that the family can grow into at HiddenHistoryMuseum.com, family. Don't forget to get that. Should I get one more call? Should I get one more call in the building? Everybody raise your hand if you're ready to get on. We'll take one more call, and then we got to wrap it up because, again, i got to do an interview with the L.A. Times in the morning, so i got to get up hella early and stuff and get groomed up and tuned up. Let's get, um, let me see, who we got? I want to get some new faces in here. Y'all raise your hand. Let's get you in here. Let's get, um, 
Let me see. Marshall, have I had you in here before? Let's get Marshall of Mayotte. Marshall of Mayotte. What's up, Marshall? Hello? What's up, Marshall? How you doing? Um, thank you uh, for bringing me on here. Um, I just want to. I'm doing good. Go ahead, bro. Uh, I just want to say I uh, appreciate what you're doing. Um, I just got a question. When are you going to um, host the next uh, reparation for uh, the reparation rally? Um, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's it takes a lot out of you to, to to put those big events together. It's a it's a thing organizing those things but you know i'm glad everybody enjoys themselves and the last one was a major vibe we had a great time out there in dc the family came in showed up showed out um big daddy came performed he was phenomenal the speakers were all phenomenal um brother afro elite was up there speaking phenomenal black alpha phenomenal dr randy short phenomenal um dr myot from baltimore phenomenal just everybody phenomenal, phenomenal, phenomenal. So I don't know when we're going to do another one like that. I do want to have, um, I want to do another big FBA event. I want to probably do it in Atlanta. Um, Got to find a space to do that down there, to do a big event in Atlanta sometime next year. And I keep people posted on that. Probably another Juneteenth event. Um, this time, really showcase a lot of the black businesses because we couldn't do that in D.C. They were very rigid about vendors and all of that stuff not being in the space. So I really wanted to showcase some of the black vendors. I like when we have the black business folks there so that people can see who's doing business around the country. So we're going to do an event in Atlanta sometime next year. And we're going to do some events like that at the museum, too, because a lot of folks want us to have vendors at the museum. And sometimes people will rent out the space. And um, we had some people rent out the um, museum and they had vendors in the patio and they had some real cool stuff out there. So, you know, I love doing business with black folks. I love my 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 brothers and sisters who are business owners. Love it. Love it. Love it. There's nothing greater than doing business with your people. I love connecting with other business folks in the community. And I, I really want us to be on that vibe, knowing who the business people are within the community so that we can support them because that empowers us all. When we support black businesses, that supports the community. That's how we built the Black Wall Streets. It was people supporting the black businesses that's how you can create a black wall street you got to have the, the money circulating among black society so that when folks need something you got black society with the resources to help out so if we need a a school built we have the black business sector contributing to that that's what happened during the jim crow era because we had so many businesses so if anything was needed in the community we just go to the business sector and they would help out. They would put things together. They would put hospitals and banks and eateries and schools. They would put that stuff together using the black business class. That's why we don't have the black business class like we used to. That's why it's, it's a little more difficult getting those things popping like we used to get them popping. You know? But um, anyway, let me get up out of here, family. Um, it's been real. I thank everybody for tuning in. Again, go to rootworkstyle.com. Go to microphonecheck.com. Also, reach out to Trump's people. Everybody, let's, let's beat this drum to let Trump and, and Ms. Harris know that we we formally put an invitation to them to come sit down with us at the Hidden History Museum. And let's just talk policy. No ambush. Nonpartisan. Nobody's married to any party. We just want to hear what policies they have, and we'll rock with whoever has the best policy. So everybody retweet that flyer, hit up Kamala Harris's people, hit up Donald Trump's people, and let's see what we can